Just like using an index in a library to find the book you need, so too does selecting the right volume of data lead to insights, informed decisions, and success. Amruta Shankar today shares her insights on turning data chaos into actionable insights on data team success with me, Ross Webb, brought to you in partnership with our friends at Amplitude. Today, we're going to be providing a fresh look at the data-driven mindset. Coming up in today's episode, from data chaos to clarity, the transition to data partnership, insights driven versus data driven. Are you a data leader grappling with data team organization? Dive into our discussion on the key challenges of managing a data team and learn master strategies to enhance efficiency and drive success. I'm Ruta. I'm excited to discuss data-driven or insight-driven. But first, I'd like to know how you organize data teams and the challenges you see within data. Okay, so uh, so we are, as a company, we're about 2,000 people. And in terms of how we've organized data itself, we've got data engineering and data product. And while they work together, we've separated the skill sets that go into the data analysis, data insights, what do you mine the data for, the data science part of it, along with the product building, which is more outbound focused. What is it that we are trying to measure and why? And and I think that is sometimes where the mistakes happen. People, because they've got so much data, they immediately jump into measuring without fully understanding why they are measuring, what they are measuring, and the how comes almost at the end of it. We will all figure out how to measure things. But it is the why that matters more than the what and then ultimately the how. And that is where, that is one of the challenges and something that I've seen a lot of our customers also trip up on. Everybody always jumps to the, I want you to measure X for me. And then I have to always unravel that to, but why? What is the outcome? What is the insight? What is the business challenge? that me measuring X for you is going to solve. And when we unravel that, they ultimately realize X would never have given them the answer. And it's not X that they need, it's actually the insight that will ultimately lead to it. And in some ways, I think my mission has been to get all of our customers to be data-led, definitely use the data, but always focus on being insights-driven. Because if you're just looking at data, Data can tell you in some ways whatever you want it to tell you. If you don't like what the total tells you, you can use the mean. If you don't like what the mean tells you, you can use the median. And it's very easy to make data, bend data to tell you what you want it to tell you. But you just always need to say, what is it I need to know to help run a better successful business? And, And that is the edge that we bring. Could you expand more about the process of moving from being a data vendor to a data partner? specifically around the insights you've gained and uh, the challenges you see? I think about when I joined, when I, uh, when I joined Cinemedia, uh, for the first few months, you know, like you do when you, when you come into a new company and you're suddenly leading a product that you not built or don't have, you spend a lot of time hearing what customers say. So, you know, I would just attend meetings to see how customers perceived us. Like, what was the dynamic? What was the relationship that we had with them? And essentially, every meeting was, they would come up with an Excel, 20 data points that we want. How soon can you give it to us? And no one in our end even asked why or how. So what would happen is, just like my previous anecdote, we would give it to them and they're like, oh, it doesn't answer our question. Can you add six more? And we ended up being a vendor. So there are two challenges with that. The moment you become a data vendor, you have almost commoditized the value of what you do. You've just said, essentially, all I'm doing is you. Ch- I charge you by the event I am adding to your data lake, but I am not at all, look- neither of us are looking at the value that this data provides you. And in creating that pivot to say, forget the data, talk to me about what business decisions you're going to make from this, what is the value I'm creating, and going on that journey towards becoming a data partner, you end up in a situation where suddenly they come to you with uh, with the questions of the business problems they have to solve. And by solving it for them, 
you have removed yourself from the I am a vendor, charge me by the data point to I am a product, I deliver value in terms of answering all of these business questions from you. And because we've established that relationship of a partner, it feels like they listen to us. Whereas if you're a vendor, they will just say, that's not your problem. I've asked you to do this. Just do it because you're a vendor and that is what I want. And it's a much higher quality relationship because, you know, data is the new oil. But frankly, if you've got oil, unless you've actually filtered out the oil to get the value, it can just end up being sludge and you could just drown in it if you didn't quite know what you were doing with it or how to harness it effectively. And that I think that journey of taking customers, if, if you're if you're a data product anywhere, it is really important to ensure that you are focused on taking your customers down that path where your dynamic changes from vendor to partner because it delivers value for everyone, not just for you as a product because you're able to charge more for a product as opposed to charging by the event. You move from a commodity to something that's more valuable, but even for your customers because they get more bang for their buck with that than with just asking for events. That's interesting. But how would you measure and validate that it really is a partnership? And, and there are a few, there are probably a few more nuanced ways of, of, of understanding when you made that shift. And obviously the easy thing is no one starts coming to meetings with you with a list of data points. But it also looks at, they start to tell you, hey, we've just launched this new series on our platform. We're looking to understand how well our subscribers are taking taking it up. Uh, we know we've got this data, but can you help us with really narrowing the scope to give us a very sharp laser eye focus? It doesn't need to be in the product. If you can just do that analysis internally and give us what we need because we are presenting this to our ELT and we want to know that we've got the right narrative in there. Or And, and sometimes it is a case of we are launching this new feature. I don't feel comfortable launching it if I don't have your product helping me measure how much of it is getting used and not just getting used in the gimmicky, oh, this is like, you know, the voice button on our remote. Everyone used it for the first week when they had it. And then a lot of the older ones, I think in my house, we, you can see the difference. My kids only use the voice button. I'm always just typing things out in the kludgy uh, way. And, and sometimes you just, end up trying to, un and they wanted to answer. So they said, I don't even want to launch this feature until your product is ready to help me understand what is the uptake? Is it a gimmick or have I made it sticky? Where are the areas for improvement? And when you see that, when you see that customers are pausing or deferring launch feature launches until they've got the right insights from you to inform it, you know you've made that change. You know that you have been part of shaping that change because they are now relying on insights to ensure that they are really being data-led and insights-driven. Well, that brings us full circle to being insights-driven. I'd love to get your thoughts on the data-led and insights-driven world. I think your insights are incredibly special. Okay. Uh, and uh, so what are the different challenges that I've faced? And, you know, the entire being tech-led or data-led, but focusing so much on the data is a very common pitfall for a lot of companies in the data world. And one of the things that we've done is there are places where, so I'll give you an example. Um, we look at number of errors. And a lot of times, customers focus obsessively on how many errors have occurred in their platform. But what happens is, if one box didn't have its internet cable connected or it's fallen off and they hit the launch iPlayer button a hundred times, you're going to get a hundred errors, but it's still only one box. It's not going to be hundred customer support calls. It's not going to be all of the things that hundred leads to. And so one of the things that I've done is in looking at insights, I've said, you don't need to know the number of errors as much as you need to understand what percentage of your base is having errors. What is the typical error rate you have in any given time period? Because typical matters, people focus so much sometimes on the outliers 
that they actually forget that the mode function really helps them understand what is typical. And it's one of those unsung heroes, I think, of statistics, the mode function. And it's something that we try to use and, you know, get our customers to understand. Sometimes averages can be misleading, especially in TV viewing, because you can have these blockbuster events that just take your averages all over the place and it starts to become meaningless. Typical is something that helps you. And it is just Understanding, you know, looking at the customer, understanding how they react, understanding what business decisions inform, get informed by this one number, make, means that as a data product team, you have to be really careful to ensure you're getting the right numbers on your dashboard. Because that is what your customer user is seeing as the first thing when they come in in the morning. And, and that is, I think, for me, one example of where you are data-led, but because you're thinking of what is the customer reaction or what is the customer value from it, you are being very insights-driven in terms of what you're doing. And another example is we've had a lot of customers, a lot of my customers in the media business, they always see Netflix as their big competition. And they all are like, you know, Netflix does things. They're very data-led. All of their decisions, whether they keep a show, cut a show, everything is based on the data. We feel that as long as we use data, we can become like Netflix. And and a lot of it is again down to, it's not about using data, it's about which insights should you be using to ensure that you are being that successful. How would you separate the content to drive decisions through insight? So, uh, so, so what we've got, we've got a series of value metrics that we've embedded in within our product where we don't just look at number of minutes watched because, you know, you take a Bollywood movie or a, uh, or a very long uh, sports event, you know, the Olympic opening ceremony. And suddenly those are like outliers that just completely take off viewing minutes. And suddenly you would think, oh, that channel is really popular. Look at the total number of minutes we've had. But then you actually break it down into not just the volume, but how many people are actually watching it and how sticky is it? Do people keep returning to that channel, to that type of program? Do they keep watching it a lot? How frequently do they watch it? And what percentage of that total viewing is dominated by this content? And when you start looking at all of these different facets of engagement, of content engagement, you then start to build up a knowledge of this content is so valuable to this small segment of customers that if you removed it, they will follow that content to whichever other platform has it. Compared to this content, happens to be one of a hundred titles that this segment of users has watched. If you removed it, they've still got 99 other titles to watch, but you will save a lot of money on it. And that is how we've spent time studying it. And you know, TD viewing is not something that's instantaneous. You've got to study it over a period of time to really get a sense of trend. So we always recommend customers at least look at three months of data. And that's generally the standard that we added into my product as well before they make a decision on, yes, this really is long tail versus niche versus mainstream. This is what we keep and continue to invest in. There's appetite for it. This is niche. Let's try to see if those niche customers can be expanded to watch more content, similar to what they like, but different. That's more mainstream. This is the long tail. Let's try to either get rid of it or get a better discount from our content providers on it. As we wrap up today, are there any final thoughts you can share on data or running data products? So, so you know, I said uh, in the beginning of our chat that I believe empathy is really important when you're building data products. And I think another angle to that is also curiosity, because when you have curiosity, you generate more value in the insights because you're not just being data led. You're actually being curious to explore and find other ways to analyze data and then take it forward. And frankly, I think empathy and curiosity are generally good skills for any product manager because it's the right way to ensure that you are spending more time in your customer shoes than in your engineer's uh, shoes because you're not trying to build the right tech solution. You're trying to build the right user product that, uh, that will be loved and used. Well, as the library closes for today, just as the right index entry leads us to the knowledge we seek, so too does selecting the right data to guide us 
to the valuable insights that we need. So stay connected with Amruta on LinkedIn. And if you enjoyed this, watch this episode with Darren Wood on cracking the data leadership code. Today's episode has been brought to you in partnership with our friends at Amplitude. So from me, Ross Webb, until next time, bye for now.